So first of all, I would like to thank the Chemical Engineer News team for giving me this opportunity. It's a great honor to be one of the alumni of this Talented 12 class. And this talk is going to be about my personal journey. Uh, and my personal journey starts in Spain, in my hometown. Uh, currently, I'm involved in outreach activities, and when I tell my story to high school students, normally they think that I became a chemist because I wanted to be as Marie Curie. However, I have to tell you that it wasn't my case. I became a chemist because I felt different, because probably I didn't fit it. And as you can imagine, it's not only because I didn't look as the typical Spanish girl, uh, it was also because I, I was really good at science, in particular on chemistry. So after finishing my high school, that it was a kind of rough time, I decided to pursue my degree in chemistry. And when I was an undergrad, I decided I started my undergrad, uh, my research and re career under the supervision of Professor Pablo Spinet and Professor Juan Casares. With them, I also developed my master degree and my PhD. And during my time at the University of Valladolid. Uh, I focus on understanding experimental approaches to reaction mechanism of palladium catalyzed processes. Basically, I spend those, those years trying to unravel how chemical processes work. That means normally the in-between step between the starting material and the desired product. So, and for my family, I was solving puzzles. So, uh, so it was great. I learned a lot. However, at the, at the, at the end of my PhD, this was my situation. So can you see the light at the end of the tunnel? Because I couldn't see it. And indeed, the tunnel is even darker if you think uh, that after fin finishing my PhD, there was a lack of professional opportunities. And that is a big problem that we face in Spain. However, one day my life changed. One of my PhD advisor, Juan, attended a symposium. And you can see here the list of a fantastic uh, plenary speaker. What he did, he approached one of them, in particular, Professor Melanie Sanford, and he talked to her about me. So he called me that night. I was in the lab and told me that I had to go immediately to that symposium So because Melanie wanted to meet me. So I took a train at 6 AM, and I went there. I felt the courage to, to approach Melanie because she was around a lot of people. And I, I, I explained her what I was doing. I gave her my CV, and after 10 days, I have a job offer in my email. So I want from here, I want to thank a lot Juan for, uh, for the extra push and Melanie for giving me the opportunity to join her uh, lab at the University of Michigan. There I kept working with the same method with palladium, but I changed the oxidation state. And what I did there is to study how to tackle one of the major challenges related to these high valent uh, palladium complexes, and is how to control the, uh, the selectivity during the reductive elimination when more than one product can be formed. And in particular, I focus my attention in carbon nitrogen bone formation because these type of bones are prevalent in agrochemical uh, material science and also drugs. So this was great. I learned a lot. I, I mentored uh, students. I even was a lecturer at the University of Michigan. However, I needed to decide what to do in the next stage of my career. So this uh, is a long story in a short. So this was a summary of my decision tree. I decided that I wanted to stay in academia. I decided that I wanted to come back to Spain because my country and different organization invest a lot of money in my education, and I wanted to give them back a little, a little bit of what I had received. And then it was the hardest uh, question to answer whether or not to start my own lab. Maybe this question is not obvious to us, and it's not only because, as you can hear, the situation for women in scientific career in top academic position is not ideal, and in Spain is even harder. It was also with that the Spanish system works a little bit different than the American one. So normally, when you finish your, uh, you after a postdoctoral stay abroad, you don't start your own group. You join a group of a senior PI, but I didn't want to do that. And then I found that there was only a place that I could find, apply for a job. So like the, the possibilities were just reduced to one, and it was the Institute of Chemical Research of Catalonia. So after knowing where I should apply for a job, the one million question was what type of chemistry I would like to do, and I think that. This is summarized in one uh, quote by Professor Richard Feynman that is also now in my current situation. Study hard what interests you the most in the most undisciplined, irreverent, and original manner possible. And I don't know if you noticed, but in all my slides, I have here a hashtag. This is the hashtag that 
that we use in my group, and we love mechanisms. So we love how to understand how chemical processes work. So if I'm here today, that means that I got the job. I was able to come back to Spain, and I joined ICIQ as, Jan of, as one of the junior group leaders. And since then, I had the privilege to work with a fantastic group of young students. They not only work really hard, we also know how to have fun. We are Spanish, and this is the, one of the last pictures from a celebration just a few weeks ago. And what is our goal? We want to tackle some of the major uh, problems that our goal faces, such as global warming on the impact of chemical synthesis following a pretty innovative philosophy. So we are focused not uh, on understanding organometallic processes relevant to catalytic transformation. And why is this innovative? Because our goal is not only to provide critical mechanistic information on well-known reactivity, but to pursue what we call a U3D goal. We want to understand, discover, design, and develop novel and more efficient transition metal catalyzed transformation. And we want to do that by trapping reaction intermediate and using them as knowledge building blocks for rational design. So let's consider any transition metal catalyzed transformation where we want to go from A plus B to C. The traditional approach is to use mechanistic study as a posterior tool for understanding successful transformation. And for me, this is what represents a, a successful transformation, a graceful tango, and where every move, movement is synchronized, every, is elegant, everything works perfectly. However, you will agree with me that most of the reaction that we put in the lab more like, looks more like this. This is less exquisite, this is like less elegant. So imagine that you know how to design this curve and you have to create a new one. You will start dancing like it, not right. So you probably will take the knowledge that you know from all this movement and you will design a new one modifying some of them. And the translation of this analogy is our, uh, to chemistry is the foundation of our research. So uh, from a mechanistic perspective, the, success, the successful or failure of any, at least from our, our point of view, of any organic trans, uh, um, chemical transformation relies on the performance of the intermediate involved in the elementary step of a catalytic cycle. This may seem really obvious, but normally is overlooked. And this can be a completely game changer for not efficient transformation. So we envision to use mechanistic studies as a really powerful tool for designing more efficient transformation by capturing this reaction intermediate and using them to overcome limitation and explore innovative reactivity. So my group, we have two different research lines. In one of them, we explored by metallic system in order to promote carbon-carbon forming reactions. We published uh, the first paper in this uh, line really, uh, really recently in Chemistry European Journal in a special issue that uh, is going to be dedicated to the 7th OK uh, Symposium that is going to be held next week in Liverpool, where I'm going to be one of the speakers in a symposium sponsored by ACS. And so if you are around in Liverpool, please be, uh, go to see my talk and some of the members of my lab. And this is the, the cover that one of my really creative students designed for, for this occasion. So if you think that I'm the one in the cover, it's not true because he doesn't wear glasses. So of course, it's, it's not me. So in the other, uh, so I, I'm going to give you just a flavor how we apply our strategy in our other research line in our uh, investigation on cobalt complexes. So probably I don't have to convince you that one of the ideal methods to, uh, for, for the formation of carbon-carbon and carbon ethereotan bonds is through the functionalization of ignite CH bonds. Among the different approaches developed over the past few uh, decades, the transition metal uh, catalyzed direct exchange functionalization using novel metals such as rhodium and palladium has emerged as a really powerful tool in organic synthesis. These strategies offer obvious advantages, such as the selective CH bond cleavage due to the employment of this directing group and the formation of this metallicyclic intermediate, and also the minimization of, of byproduct. However, one of the still current challenges is the uh, scarce number of methodologies uh, developed using earth abundant first of methyl, and we turn our attention toward cobalt. Over the past five years, as you can see in the graph, uh, cobalt complexes has demonstrated the capability to perform this type of functionalization. And the flourishing of this field is not only that cobalt is a cost-effective alternative to analogous rhodium base one, but also because this type of complexes you, uh, exhibit a unique reactivity. However, from our point of view, there is, a, uh, there when at the time that we started this project back in 2016, there was a major limitation that was preventing to bring cobalt to its 
ultimate capability, and it was the limited understanding of the nature of the reactive species or the mechanism involved in this transformation. So, and um, probably due to the proposed reversible nature of this CH activation step that happened at that time to detect this A type of intermediates. So, as we used to say in the lab, we started this, pro this project chasing unicorns because everyone proposed this, uh, these complexes, but no one see them until, until uh, we started this, this, this preacher line. So I just I'm going to give you a brief overview of our initial contribution in the field in the context of oxidative alkanulation. We were able to, to access this A type of intermediates through an alternative uh, route uh, using a really important uh, reaction in organometallic chemistry and oxidative addition and using this acetonitrile as a stabilizing ligand that is crucial for ac accessing otherwise highly reactive intermediate. Next, we tested the catalytic efficiency of our cobalt cycle versus the most widely used CP star cobalt 3 precatalyst because normally it's envisioned that if you can isolate a compound, that means that it's not going to be reactive. But in our case, it was completely the opposite. Our uh, precatalyst is more active. Indeed, we can load the catalyst loading to just one more percent, that this is the, one of the lowest in this type of cobalt catalyst transformation. And even we were able to obs uh, observe a resting step other uh, reactive intermediate under catalytic conditions. That turned to be this member ring cobalt cycle uh, due to the, the reactivity of this alkyne uh, with this, uh, that insert in this car uh, carbon cobalt bond. We were able to catch this intermediate and characterize it uh, under different, with different analytical techniques. So when we published this work last year in Angevante Chemie and they offered us to design a cover, the analogy of a camera taking picture, we thought that it was a really visual one. So before finishing, if you want to know more about our recent advances, please check our last paper. We are really excited because we were able to overcome the reversible nature of the CH methylation step and isolate more uh, reactive cobalt intermediate. But not only that, we were able to design more efficient transformation using this capture intermediate uh, by unraveling the boosting effect of this perfluorinated alcohol, HFIP, not only in the CH activation step, but also under catalytic conditions. So, before finishing, uh, I hope I was able to transmit you my passion for mechanistic studies. My home take message is that the capture of reaction intermediate uh, can be an extremely powerful tool for posting the synergy between mechanistic studies and catalysis in order to promote the rational design of more efficient transformation. And this is the most important slide of my talk. Uh, I want to thank the former and corporate member of my group. They are awesome. Sometimes it's really challenging to go to a new lab and they took the risk, so I'm really grateful for that. I also want to thank the funding, especially ICIQ, for giving me the opportunity to start my own independent group uh, back in Spain. And this empty space is really important for me. I want to thank my former advisor. They are awesome. They still help me a lot to navigate in this uh, new uh, independent career. And of course, my family and friends, because they support me uh, in this sometimes rocky road. Again, thanks Chemical Engineering News for this opportunity and uh, enjoy the coffee break.